You'll freak hey, you. everyone. Are you on the right side now, John? Yep, John I'm on the right. Yes. John likes a certain side. I don't notice. He notices. <laughs> so right was that, right when I was clicking live, uh, he said, "Wait, I'm on the wrong side." So it just swapped us. It's good to see you, babe. Um, good to see you too. Yeah, good to see you. Um, some people thought we were all hanging out this uh, weekend together as a family. We were not. Um, the only thing that happened is um, we have. I have my little guy. We have our little guy with us here in Boise or I do. And, uh, so yeah. So, um, miss you, babe. Thanks for doing what you're doing and we appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate you too. Although you did not give me the time codes, which is why we were late tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a little confusing, but it's not a long call, so we'll be okay. Yes. Yes. Um, it's been a big week. Um, I've been talking about it a lot. Let me let me share a little bit. I was on Web Sleuth Friday night uh, talking about this. I'd recommend you, um, you know, anyone going to that show and hearing about the last week of trial. And then today I was on Mormon Stories uh, over on their YouTube channel, which I also recommend going and listening to. I was on a wonderful panel there along with um, a friends from our program. And now I finally am able to be with Dr. Bay, with my Bay. So and this is what we've been looking forward to. Everyone, thanks for your understanding last night, too, uh, that we had this planned. We go live every Saturday night. And uh, last night, things changed. And so thank you. Thank you. It was good to be with the Woodcocks last night and Crusha and uh, be with all of you tonight. So thank you so much. Dr. John, where do you want to start tonight? I could talk about anything, um, anything at all. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we should start with the the summer shiftlet call because I, I think that to me, that has to be one of the more emotional moments of this entire trial. That and Colby and probably the evidence related to the bodies are for me have been the most emotional moments. So... But let's start with that. I I don't okay. know. Did did you want to did you want to make a few observations about the call? You were in court. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll share a little bit about this call. So clearly, uh, many people, most of you, have, I'm sure, heard the summer shiftlet call. We had heard that it was going to be very emotional. We had heard Colby's call, and we knew that, um, or I I had known that there was a summer call for a few months that nobody had heard, and that it was going to be emotional. And it certainly was that. Um, when it comes to the Cox family or Lori's um, family of origin, we've heard very little from them. Um, Janice and Janice, Lori's mother, and Summer made a statement early on in the case uh, when the children were missing, saying Lori would never hurt her children. I th Was it 20... 20 or 48 hours, I think it was 2020, that they never hurt her, Lori would never hurt her children, as well as stating that Kay Woodcock was uh, trying to take JJ from Lori, thus they were in hiding. She sort of went with that narrative. So with that being the only thing we've really heard from the Cox family, along with uh, now my interview with, uh, with Megan on our channel, um, I think that it was very emotional for many people to hear Summer and how she has been affected and how her family has been affected in the courtroom. People were crying and listening. Summer was crying. Lori was crying. Um, Summer was on the stand. Lori was actually crying during a lot of Summer's testimony and was listening they were close growing up, as we've also heard from Megan and Summer, close sisters. And uh, I, I think it's been a long time since Summer has seen her sister. So I'm sure it was emotional for those two as well. And I'll have questions, too, for you, John, about the emotions Lori how showing was the, in court. How was the jury reacting to the Summer call? With emotion. Some yeah. were looking at some were looking at Lori 
okay. the whole time. Others were looking at summer and some are looking down. Um, it was emotional. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was, yeah. So I just listened to it a couple of days ago and then I went back to it the other day and yeah, I, I was very emotional listening to it. You know, it's, it's, the emotion is so raw and so genuine. I think it's, it's not as a, as a compassionate human being, it's hard not to respond to that. So, you know, the, I think summer's expressing what a lot of us feel have felt about this case and have been unable to express. So I, I feel like there was such raw anger and such raw, there was a certain amount of rage, you know, at the, at the beginning of the call, Summer was actually so worked up. She could barely talk. She was, I couldn't understand her in the beginning. She was almost inaudible. So, you know, that that level of rage and that level of anger, it's just, it's, it was just, for me, it was not only extremely emotional and, and I felt a lot of sadness, but I think that, I think that there was something a little bit cathartic to me as well in the sense that. I think maybe Summer was expressing what a lot of us who have followed this case for the last few years have felt. And, you know, we're, we're obviously not, because we're not personally involved at that level, we can't, we're not going to experience that kind of anger. But I think it's very, it was for me, it was very cathartic to have someone else do that and have someone else express, I think, what at least I was feeling and perhaps a lot of our listeners may have felt about this case. So... So it was an incredible moment to me. And, you know, it, it it was similar in that sense, I think, to Colby. I think there was something very cathartic about Colby's call, too, that Colby is giving voice to the victims and Summer's giving voice to the victims and they're expressing this rage and this, this you know, almost disbelief that a lot of us have felt for, for the list for us, for for the people that have followed this case. So I think there was... There was something cathartic, you know, of course, something incredibly sad about it, but cathartic. So that's kind of how I, I responded to it. It was very emotional to me, as, as was Colby's call. Right. Um, it was emotional. Thank you to AJ and Bird's Nest for your generosity. Uh, yeah. So as far as how John and I, you know, John follows uh, my live tweeting and uh, when I ask him to listen to certain audio or certain witnesses, he does that through the week. Um, thank you. And I know that um, everyone wants, John, including me, we all want to pick your brain every night and find out every little detail of every single thing. And so we are so grateful that you come on with us at least once a week um, to share and answer a few questions. So I try to pick the most important things that we need, John, uh, to answer for us. So I have a list about three or four things tonight. If anybody else has uh, anything really important, yeah, throw that in the comments and we'll start with this summer call. I, I, I think we all have a lot of questions about this. Thank you to our moderators tonight too. And throughout the week, this has been, it's, this is, this week has been not just busy for me and for John and for hidden true crime. Our moderators are incredible. We've added new moderators. We've, um, We've really relied on our community for the past month. So thank you so much. Um, I know that this trial is so important to so many of us. So thank you, all of you. Let's start with the summer call. The whole, the entire summer call is 12 minutes long. Did you want to listen to the whole thing or the last half? Should we listen to about six minutes of it? The last half that you felt was important? Uh, I think the last, yeah, the last half I think is the most, well, I mean, it, it, she's, rep she's a little repetitive. I think she's, she's clearly trying to express how, her anger and her disbelief. And so she'll say things, she'll repeat things. She'll say, you know, she, one of the things she repeats several times is that Lori was dancing, dancing on the beach when the children's bodies were buried in Chad's yard. And of course, Lori doesn't really, Lori never says a lot. I don't think she can, obviously she knows she can't by the way. So that, Again, and, you know, this is before Lori was deemed to be incompetent. There was a period there of, what, six months or eight months where she was considered to be incompetent and unable to stand trial. And, you know, this type of call actually, I think, is provides some evidence that clearly at some certain moments in time that she was competent. 
because she says clearly, I can't talk about that. I can't like, she understands the decision-making process. She understands what's going on in this call. It, so at, at this moment in time, which was June, 2020, we can see that at this point that Lori, I think would have been considered competent to stand trial. So it's interesting that she's gone through these different phases where she's competent, incompetent. And I, and I don't know for sure, by the way, but I mean, just based on her thought processes and her decision-making and her self-awareness, like her ability to kind of read the room and read summer. Uh, she seems quite capable or quite competent in this moment. So it's interesting that, you know, six months later or whatever it was, all of a sudden she's not competent and there's questions about schizophrenia and there's questions about her mental health, larger mental health issues. And uh, so part of the question I would ask is, does she go from in June of 2020 to into 2021? Does she then develop schizophrenia in six to eight months? Right. I, I don't know. I mean, that, that seems... <laughs> Seems peculiar to me, but, um, and I don't know the diagnosis, by the way. So I don't know if it was schizophrenia. There's some speculation that some of our mods have helped us with, with to, to kind of break down what the diagnosis might have been from some of the publicly released information. Uh, it seems there was some speculation that it might have been schizoaffective. So, but to go from someone who, is clearly reading the room and showing a fair amount of awareness and some capacity for decision-making in this call of summer to some type of schizophrenia, say something on the schizophrenia spectrum. Uh, that's an interesting transformation in a very short period of time. So I don't know what's going on there. You know, I haven't seen any evaluations, but that's another question I think that this raised for me. Yeah. And we're getting a lot of questions. And then I just want to share this before, again, we start the summer call. Some people are asking about uh, Chad Daybell's 911 call. Other people are yeah. asking about Lori's mental state in trial as well as in this call. Uh, those are a few questions. I am seeing them. I'm saying them all out loud right now because I sometimes miss them. Yeah, reaction to the Daybell 911 call. And I, yeah, of we'll course, would like that. to talk about, to t about Tammy for a little bit. Tricia, thanks so much for being here too. It's so good. For those of you that are here from Web Sleuths, so thank you, Tricia, for, for sharing the link. And um, she shared the link yesterday when we rescheduled, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I love being on your show, Tricia. Make sure to share the link in chat and everyone uh, check out Tricia's Web Sleuths show. Thank you to all the generosity here too. All right. I will present this. Um, I believe that I'm about to share East Idaho News's uh, summer call. We uh, stream the audio every day, the court's audio every day here at Hidden True Crime. Uh, but East Idaho News has done a great job just taking out bits and pieces of the audio and sharing them. So I'm going to share their uh, call here. Just one second. Do you think that your mother and your sister and your son don't deserve 
want to know that the children are gone? Why wouldn't you call and tell us that? Why were we cut off? You saying you want to go on and be happy? You were just going to be happy without your family and your life until you're stuck in jail and I'm the only one stupid enough to be your friend when I've been your best supporter, Lori. I've loved you my whole life. I still do. I can't bear to think of anything bad about you. It hurts me. I don't want to see you in jail. I don't want you to be there. I don't want people to misunderstand. If you would tell me the truth, I would stand up for you for the rest of the time. You know that I would. I knew you would. But there is nothing okay about this. Nothing. I knew. If you think it's okay, well, you have greatly been deceived if you nothing think it is about okay. This is okay. Nothing about this is okay. Lori, this summer. We have all read the scriptures. I know you've told me about a lot of your spiritual experiences. You know I'm trying to support you in all of them. But I am telling you, because I love you with all my heart, please consider that Chad has lied and been deceived and that you have been deceived and that this is not what you think it is. There is nothing okay about killing children. Nothing. And even if you didn't kill them and Chad didn't kill them and Alex didn't kill them, you threw them away like the garbage in the ground. You, Tyler's both are burned. You, I can't have me going in that and threw her in a pet cemetery. You know that's so degrading. How can you let them do that? I don't understand. It's so painful. I can't even tell you. I don't know what I've been saying, but please consider that you have been deceived. That is not Christ-like. There's nothing good in that. There's nothing good in that. That's not a test for you. They were innocent. And they were loved. And they didn't deserve to be treated that way. And who loved them their whole life and took care of them their whole life. So why would you not be buried that me. way? I didn't. Well, then come up with an explanation publicly. Yeah. Um, so is my mic on? Your mic's off. Your mic's off, Lauren. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So there's there's an awful lot to unpack in that brief segment there, and cup, a couple. And of we are here there. for it. So, a couple of people were making some interesting comments. Uh, one person I noticed said, "Let's start with this." So one person said that Lori's go-to statement is, "You know me. <laughs> you know me. You know." When, whenever I hear that statement, by the way, it's always a red flag. Because they're, you're appealing, they're appealing to something that they hope someone remembers or knows about you from the past that they, su they assume is constant. And nobody's constant. We all change. So that's a red flag. When you say, you know me, you're, you're trying to appeal to some version of a person that they hope you still cling to, even though there's a likely chance that that person changed. The other problem with this, you know me, is... Lori doesn't know herself. So when, when somebody says, you know me, and they don't know themselves, run as fast as you can. <laughs> because the problem here is I don't believe that Lori's ever really had a good understanding of who she is and her values and what she stands for. And I've talked about how in some ways religion is kind of a proxy self for her. And so if you don't know yourself, how can others possibly know you? Right. So this, this right. whole, you know, me is a real red herring. It's a real problem. And the, you know, the, and Summer's right. She doesn't know her. She's probably never known her because Lori doesn't know who she is herself. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So when people appeal to that, they're looking for, the goal is to find some sort of, of constancy. They want to assume that all of us are stable creatures that, 
ourselves don't change. So they're appealing to something from childhood or past experiences that she hopes Summer will cling to. And the reality is there's nothing there to cling to. And Summer knows this. So I think this is a real, this is a very kind of manipulative, deceptive way to try to get Summer back on her side. It's not going to work. You know, Lori doesn't know who she is. So, so that's, that's a problem. So let's start with that. The next thing that really the lead to that entire segment you played was nobody knows, nobody in the world knows. They, nobody knows what I've been through. Nobody saw me on the floor crying. People have only seen what's on TV about this case. They don't know. They don't understand, you know, so you have Lori, this is something Lori does frequently. You have Lori adopting the victim stance. Yes. So we're not, we're not, we shouldn't be concerned about the fact that the two children are buried in Chad's yard and we have no explanation for that except for this apparent, I don't know how else to call it, this apparent supernatural experience. The way Lori describes it, this whole, you weren't there and you don't understand, like it, it, it almost, to me, it implies that there's some some type of supernatural undertaking going on. There's something here that we don't understand that's not of this world. And so she's always appealing to kind of this nebulous, paranormal, supernatural type explanation. Um, and so because of that, she's the victim that people don't understand whatever this, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I'd call it a delusion, whatever this belief is that she has. Somehow we don't understand it and she's the victim because we don't know what she's been through. And, you know, when I see this, when I see this type of situation where someone becomes the victim or plays the victim role, my first thought is personality disorder. (laughs) Right. So for any of you out there who know personality disorders and we could speculate about what type of personality disorder, I don't really know here. Maybe there's, you know, it's probably cluster B, which would be antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic. I don't know. They all run together. Could be any of them. You know, obviously I have never met Lori, so I can't diagnose, but, but this victim card is a problem because playing the victim card almost always is indicative, especially under these circumstances where the evidence is overwhelming, where your sister is challenging you to tell the truth and you're the victim not the real victims not jj and tylee and tammy and charles they're not victims because you weren't there to see it so you can't understand not only are they not victims they love her you know according to her call with yeah they love her they love me right um yeah pity play uh, in the sociopath next door with uh doctor written by dr martha stout she talks about pity play, which is the same thing. She said, you know, people ask me what to look for when it comes to sociopaths or psychopaths. And uh, she says, it's not what people think. They think there's going to be some sinister detail that they'll be able to point out. And then she states, no, it's pity play. It's the play to people's sympathy. That is the number one thing to look for. Whether or not you agree with that, I don't know. I'm, I'm quoting Dr. Martha Stout right. here, but that, yeah. that has always stuck with me. Pity play. The victim. Yeah, it's a it's a classic book. It's a classic work. I recommend it. It's I think it's a little dated now, but it's it's excellent. It's a really good introduction to psychopathy. She calls it sociopaths. Same thing, more or less. Um, but cluster B. <laughs> cluster B. Yeah, let's just call it cluster B. So, so you've got Lori playing this victim role. I think that's usually indicative that again, like like saying you know me. Well, uh, you know, she doesn't know you. Clearly, you've changed if you have. And she probably didn't know you when you were a child because you didn't know yourself. So, but here we have her playing the victim. And that's always a bad sign. You know, I think if you, if you look around the world today, there's so many people who, who get caught with their hand in the cookie jar and they're all victims. None of them take responsibility. You know, and the, the problem with being a perpetual victim is you don't learn you don't grow. You're not taking in information. You're, and we know that would be true with Lori. She's so rigid. She's got this rigid belief system. Her whole life is based on this religiosity. So she's not going to change. She's going to filter the world through that belief system. She's always going to be the victim. 
and that and so we see that here then she yeah. gets in this is to me this is just an incredible contrast that summer brings up she brings it up three or four times but this whole you were dancing on the beach with a smile on your face taking wedding photos and at the same time simultaneous with that your children were buried in the ground right what a what a contrast so it's such a powerful description that you know the contrast between Lori's happiness and Lori being kind of self-centered and dancing around and her kids are completely immobile and buried in the ground and their lives are over and it's yeah. just it's it's a remarkable it's a remarkable contrast to me and I you know Summer, if Summer really wanted to drive that point home, she did. So, and people have pointed out that after she says you were dancing on a beach, the first thing Lori says is, yeah, months later. And I think many people have taken that to be a bit of a confession in the sense that Lori seems to be acknowledging that the children were killed and they were in the ground and she knew it. And months later, she was dancing on a beach. So, Although it wasn't months later either. We'll just say weeks yeah, well, it was right. Well, you mean in terms of when September yeah. September eighth was JJ, September twenty second was Tylee, October nineteenth was Tammy, November fifth was the wedding. Yeah, and then so this is long. another incredible moment in this call where Lori says well, I need to go on with my life. I'm trying to be happy, right? It, I, that, when she said that, that, that just, that just made me cringe. That was just a unbelievably insensitive moment. Again, I think she's, she's playing the victim role, but more than that, She's showing like there's there's this absolute inability to grieve. You know, her kids just died or her kids were murdered, allegedly. I guess it hasn't been proven yet, but it hasn't been shown to be true by a jury. But we'll see her kid. Her kids are in the ground. Somebody murdered them. Correct. And clearly we know that. And she's and, and, and about, the ground that they're in is uh, belongs to her uh, husband. Yeah. So, and she's trying her big thing here is she's trying to be happy. I mean, well, I don't, you know, thankfully we've never lost a child and, you know, I'm sure some people have, and you know, that's, that's a lifelong process of grieving. And here we are two months later and she's dancing on a beach as summer points out, trying to be happy. And you know, she's saying to Summer, hey, just leave me alone. I'm, you know, what about my happiness? I mean, what a normal human being grieves. A normal human being experiences loss and trauma when their kids are gone. And she doesn't have any of that, right? So we've talked about the, the distress emotions, which are sadness and fear, and how I've talked about some of the research on psychopaths showing that sadness and fear are often, the distress emotions are often absent in psychopaths. And here we have an instance of, and I'm not saying she's a psychopath. I'm just throwing this out there, talking about the research. Here we have an instance of her inability to feel sadness, even though her children have been dead for two months or less. And her inability to process this loss, her inability to grieve, but mostly just this absolute lack of sadness, which is peculiar. It's concerning clearly. So again, this kind of brings us back to the terrain of personality disorders. Why is it that she can't grieve? Why is it that she's so concerned about her happiness and doesn't care about her kids? Right. And these are all things that drive Summer crazy on this call. These are all things that us or hopefully normal, compassionate people respond to. We Normal human beings respond to the stress emotions. We respond to sadness. We respond to fear. We want to help people that are afraid. We want to help people that are sad. That's what we do. That's how we've survived thousands of years is, in, you know, in small groups or groups as humans. And so, so that's absent. You don't see that here. She's just concerned about going on with her life, even though it's only been two months and being happy. So, so I think 
what stands out in this call for me, and so that's an amazing moment to me, is just that this contrast between happiness, her happiness, and her unwillingness to grieve and experience some sadness. So I think you, you see a Lori that's unemotional. You see a Lori that's defiant. You know, this is, I think we talked a little bit about when the pictures of the bodies were shown and Lori wanted to be excused for the afternoon and didn't want to see them. I talked about how the fight or flight response kind of kicked in and because Lori couldn't fight, she had to resort to other options. And so, but, so I think this, and this is more the typical Lori, I think this kind of defiant, I'm going to fight. Her first response I think is to kind of fight and be oppositional and to take you on because she's got the answers. She knows the truth. Clearly you weren't there to see the truth, right? There's this kind of defiant attitude. Right. She's very unemotional. She plays the victim. And so here you, this is, this is, this is what Lori looks like. I have a question when it comes to the specifics of her pity play or being the victim. I actually asked this on the lunch live, which I don't think you saw that day. I was thinking about it. Lori does play the victim and that is typical of Lori, typical Lori. Right. She's definitely doing that. But I thought it was interesting to me and I was curious about what, it, how, how she was playing the victim, the reasons that she was the victim, the specific reasons. And it was, you don't know what I've been through in my life and you don't know you know, the pain I've been in, um, I, you know, and she implies again, crying, uh, you know, on the floor. And then of course, you know, Bravo summer for saying, once again, you were dancing on the beach <laughs> with your new husband in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Thank you summer for reminding her of that. But going back to, I just find it a weird flex, like uh, of all the things to be a victim for it's, you don't know what I've been through in my life. And I was curious if you had any thoughts on that because you and I have speculated about Lori's past before and, and you've also stated some things about um, what Satan means to her and a testimony she shares. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about what she's saying there. Yeah, you know, there's, there's, it's, there's always these references to her past and crying on the floor and there's there tends to be, there seems to be a lot of veiled references to potentially some type of abuse in her past, but she never states it. So we don't know for sure. We've heard other people kind of make some references to this, but Lori's never, ever disclosed it. So, so it's not entirely clear, but if there was some type of abuse, maybe physical or sexual, I don't know. It could be either one, maybe both. I don't know. We just don't know, but I think that would go a long way to helping to explain her personality. And, you know, there's some research supporting the idea that there's some correlation between, it's not perfect, but there's a correlation between different, some types of abuse and later personality disorders, such as borderline personality disorder, or even psychopathy. So yeah. do we know for sure? We don't know, but there's, there's a lot of indirect references to, to that idea, to that notion. So, and her family is not the healthiest family on the planet. I mean, they're not the unhealthiest either, but, but there's, there do seem to be a lot of references to that possibility. I'm so sorry, Kathy for what you just shared. I'm so, so sorry. Yeah. Um, I've wondered that too. You know, I wonder about her dad. I wonder about things she went through in her life. And again, I'm not trying to make her the victim or yeah. um, allow her to be the victim in this situation. I just feel like she might be referring to something in particular that, that, and it just made me curious, but thank you for sharing that. Yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of references that kind of deal with that topic. One of the more interesting and probably more difficult or profound references is by Sue Grand, 
She is a professor and psychoanalyst, and her book is called The Reproduction of Evil. It's a fascinating account of how the cycle of the abuse happens and how trauma and abuse impact people's later functioning and personalities. Um, what else, baby? Anything else in this call? I think those are the main points I wanted to cover. Just, you know, it's, it's a difficult call to listen to. It's, it's the type of call I imagine that probably had a really profound impact upon the jury and everybody who listened to it apparently, except for Lori, but I guess Lori was in tears. So that's interesting. Yeah, that's too. a question I have. That That's a question I have. Um, why was she crying? Uh, she was emotional. The tears were real. Her face was red. Um, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say real. I don't know that there were tears. Her face was red. I guess Alec Murdoch had a red face too, but, uh, she's, you know, we've never seen the only other time I really saw her doing this. There were two other days and her emotions seemed real. Yeah. I, why was she crying? Were her tears real? Uh, you know, she hasn't seen Summer in a long time. She hasn't talked to Summer in a long time. I think that in and of itself would be emotional. She, I, I think this is kind of a complex question. I think we'll, we'll get into this more when we talk about Chad's 9-11 call, 911 call. Um, in the sense that sometimes emotions are complicated that it's, I think a lot of us have this perception that emotions are either, or that if we feel happy, we can't feel sadness, or if we feel sadness, we can't feel happy, you know, but that's actually a little bit of a misconception. There's some research showing that people process mixed emotions often, and we can have multiple emotions at the same time. So I, I think you might have a little bit of that. I don't know that she's She's not necessarily crying. I don't think for obviously for the, for the kids or for what happened, I think she's crying because her sister is there and that's emotional and her sister is more or less throwing her under the bus and that's emotional. So, uh, you know, I don't know the, why the tears exactly. It's hard to say probably the emotions of the moment, the emotions of summer being there more so than the emotions of the murders. That makes sense. She has reasons to be crying. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that's true. She was looking at her sister and, and it makes sense. She hasn't seen her sister for a long time. Um, right. Or talk to her or talk to her. She's been away. She's been, she's been in jail and to hear, you know, summer also say like, I don't want to see you in jail. I don't want you there. You know, I also feel summer had a lot of empathy for the children. Yeah with the things she was upset about, she wasn't saying, you know, how could you do this to me? She wasn't playing the victim. Like Lori was playing the victim. How could you do this to me? How could you make our family look like this? She was saying, these are children. You did this to children. Um, right. they were innocent children. There's nothing she would say. She was saying a couple of times, there's nothing in the scriptures about killing children. There's nothing okay about killing children, right? Whether it's in the scriptures or not, obviously there's nothing. So she goes back to that too. She goes back to that refrain, but it, yeah, but I, I don't think that's why she's crying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from this? Um, just, you know, a fascinating call, uh, uh, an emotional call. It's, I, I think it's going to be a high impact call. I agree on the jury, just as Colby's is going to be a, a really incredibly high impact call or a moment in this trial. So in all trials, you look for these types of moments with the Murdoch case. Clearly it was the, the Paul video in the kennels just minutes before the murders occurred. Um, I, you know, looking back at this trial, I think, you know, once there's an outcome, I think we're going to ask the question, what were the moments that mattered the most? I, you know, I could see this being one of those moments with Summer and Colby. Agree. I think those will be the moments that the jurors don't forget. 
Agree. Right. And I've talked about this idea of anchored narratives, not to repeat this too much, but the juries are swayed by the most compelling story and they're looking for these kinds of points of reference that they can anchor their story on. And so the more the prosecution can throw out this type of evidence that's emotionally compelling and that fits the story that they're trying to present, then the more compelling it's going to be for a jury, the more persuasive it's going to be for a jury. So, so these are, these are really amazing moments for the prosecution at least. Uh, another thing that the jurors I don't believe will ever forget is um, the state of the children's bodies, their autopsies, what we learned about what they suffered. I don't yeah. even want to get into it too much today. I've been listening to it all week. I've been talking about it with people all week. Um, I spent the evening with the Woodcocks last night and we did not mention it. And that felt really good. We enjoyed gumbo made by Kay and her potato salad and um, talked about, I think, David Warwick, <laughs> but not was about. The, was the gumbo spicy? It was spicy and it was delicious and it's the best gumbo I've ever had. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I would expect that. Yeah, I, I'm. And it was Summer Shiflet who told our hidden gems that uh, the only thing she really knew about Kay uh, was that she made an amazing potato salad. So I got to try it last night officially. And it is amazing. So as far as the state of the children's body, I don't think we'll go over the details of us. Uh, well, we're going to talk about Tylee a little bit, but we're only going to talk about a couple of things because I think there's some things we really want to ask you. I know that on Web Sleuths, um, Trish and I talked about something that we both wanted to ask you and hope that you can answer for us. Other people, I've sent you three or four questions. So we're going to talk about Tylee for a little bit again for more for um, we're just going to talk about this one specific thing with Tylee. So, so trigger warning to anyone that's um, a little bit worn out like I am from hearing these very, very difficult details about children. Tylee remains. Um, we learned a lot more about them this week, how they were. We'd all heard that she was mutilated. Her remains were mutilated that, um, Bones were charred, um, you know, a melted flesh, just on and on and on. That they had to pick up fragments of everything. Uh, she, Tylee, when she arrived for her autopsy, was in several bags, paper bags, smaller bags. And, uh, and then there was one large body bag. What they were able to uncover through a um, anthropologist, through evidence. You know, her her autopsy was not your average autopsy. JJ's took a few hours. This one took several days. And again, they brought in at one point an anthropologist and they brought in other experts, uh, an expert who also identifies weapons used. So this is what we learned. The most intact part of Tylee's body was her, uh, were her hips, her pelvis area, uh, where, and also a few vertebrae of her spine. That was the only real part of her that was still intact. We saw that in court. We saw that was seen Tylee, you know, to see that that was what was left of her along with her, um, along with a charm, uh, a necklace found, uh, of a wave found in the fire pit. And she had been wearing that necklace get pictures of her. So they noticed um, what are called sharp traumas. The anthropologist noted sharp traumas uh, on several places of her pelvis that were clearly made from the front and the back of her while she was laying down. Um, and uh, noted that it was not normal for a dismemberment. I'd like to say, I don't think a dismemberment is ever necessarily normal, but when you're an anthropologist studying humans and remains, I'm sure that it's a normal part of your studies. And so she was saying that this is not usually when someone's dismembering someone, it's at the joints. And this was not at the joints. This was in just different parts of her bone. There were what she would call again, sharp traumas, mostly around all of around of her pelvis area, her groins, her hips. 
and then front and back. And then the weapons expert came in to identify the weapons used. We saw microscopic. I mean, they really studied this. We saw close-ups of the bones. We saw the cuts. Let's call them, let's call them stabs. We saw these cuts in her bones and another, the weapons expert pointed out that some of the weapons likely had, um, sharp teeth along a blade. He suggested either a machete or a hatchet used. And then we found Tylee's DNA on uh, multiple shovels of Chad's as well as an ice pick of Chad's. Her charred flesh was still on the ice pick. And so there has been talk of wondering if there was something sexual going on when it came to stabbing and hurting and wounding Tylee's body in yeah. that area. Let me just back up a little bit and go to the, we've talked about the idea of overkill. So we, we talked about that with Koberger, for example, there's when you harm someone, when you kill someone, you can do it fairly readily without, you know, you can stab someone once and kill them. You don't need to stab them 30 times. And so when you do that, that's called overkill. So overkill is usually indicative of something, some psychological state, anger, rage, malice. There's so many things that, that we could come up with, but it, it certainly seems like the state of Tylee's body would be in would seem to indicate that there was an overkill and that the people doing this, presumably Alex and Chad, had a tremendous amount of anger towards Tylee. And so having said that, and having given what you said about the pelvis, and as someone who's worked with hundreds of sex offenders over the years. It certainly makes me question whether there was some type of sexual assault here. And sadly, I think that's possible. You know, I, I think of the moment. Do you remember early on when I don't know? I don't remember if we're allowed to reveal this source. I think you may have. You did an interview with. Give me some hints and I can a tell victim, you. A victim, and remember in South America that that Alex was. Oh yeah, we can't reveal the source of her, but okay. Um, yeah, I've talked to her. There was a woman in um, Colombia who met Alex, ended up having sex with Alex. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Do you, so yes, and and so there was a moment in that I remember. You know, I remember that inter. The thing I remember the most about that interview, even though we can't really talk about it too much, in we can talk about it in broad terms. Well, we but, can we can talk about what happened to her specifically. We cannot give her identity. Is all okay. There was, yeah. There was a moment when you talked to her when she said that Alex had this look in his eyes during one of their sexual encounters where she was afraid for her life. She felt like he had this maniacal look that he was capable of violence, and she was afraid. And I, I think when you when we talk about what's going on with Tylee's body, I think about that moment. Is it possible that there was some type of sexual violation here or assault? I mean, I think about that moment with Alex, and the answer has to be yes, because there does seem to be potentially, and you know, I, I can't confirm this, but based upon our sources and what we've learned about Alex, there seems to be potentially some sexual deviance there. So well, I don't let's know. Share, let's share what his ex-wife said. His ex-wife said that he, while she was married to him, had sex with a 15 year old. And people have said that he was excommunicated twice because he was promiscuous and couldn't control things. Right. We've heard a lot about him. He would go to Columbia and we have a police interview with Adam Cox saying that uh, Alex did go there to Columbia to meet women. I think we have a lot of, we, we, we spoke to one of the women he met there. I think we have a fair amount of evidence saying yes. Yeah. 
So what was this, you know, and, and Alex was not a, Alex was not particularly close to Tylee either. So when you, when you combine those elements, you know, sadly, I think there's, there's some potential for that. And I would even raise that issue with Chad, by the way, is Chad, Chad has some history of, well, Julie Rowe claims that, that Chad sexually assaulted her. Yes. So. During an energy healing session. Right. And there's other women who have now come forward and said that Chad was aggressive with them. And so I, I wouldn't, who know, you know, take, and I know for a fact that there was a woman from Arizona and having an, an emotional affair allegedly with Chad and her husband ended up calling Chad and said, leave, leave my wife alone. So, yeah. So I, right. So to, to me, the, was it, the only feasible reason to assault or defile that part of the body, well, not the only, but a compelling reason, given the histories of Chad and Alex, presumably a compelling reason would be that there was something sexual going on. And so I don't, I wouldn't rule it out. Do I know for sure? It's still speculation, but no, it's possible. I've read Chad's books, including his uh, Grave Digger book. Um, I think I used to, I think it's the only book I actually brought with me, but I'm not seeing it on my temporary, in my temporary office here. Uh, He actually had a story in his book, One Foot in the Grave, where as somebody had forgotten to put shoes on a, on a, a mortuary had forgotten to put shoes on a corpse and ran the shoes over to Chad as he was, as this gentleman was being put in the ground in his coffin and asked Chad to put the shoes quickly on this gentleman, this body before it was laid into the ground and jaw and Chad implies being disgusted by this, that he opened the casket and couldn't do it. So he just put the shoes in the casket and didn't put them on his feet because he couldn't handle the fact. I think about that a lot because Tammy's alive at this time. Chad and Alex are out there burning fire, burning limbs. Like how can a man go from I'm too disgusted to put shoes on a corpse to allowing a young girl to be mutilated on his property? He's mission driven. He's driven by this higher purpose or this higher mission to achieve the new Jerusalem and to right, he he sees Tylee as being a zombie. He sees her as being less than human, and so I think I think that he's 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 not looking at where Tammy is. He's not considering how Tammy would feel. I think he's he's self absorbed. He's completely immersed in being with Lori. He's completely immersed in this whole fantasy world he's created, and I think he's trying to live that out. So I think it that would allow him to overlook the elements of this story that you're talking about. Okay. Well, what about, what about the dead body story? Not Tammy, but the dead body story. Well, so if one corpse and then, and then giving, you know, and then having her burnt charred flesh on his, you know, tools. Well, We don't know. We don't know how much Chad did. We don't know how how much Alex did. And as far as if we go back to the possibility of sexual assault, I, you know, I hate to raise this prospect, but we don't know when it occurred. She could have been alive for all we know. So they, I don't know how far are we they know, willing we to know go? That, we know that she wasn't burned alive. I want to say, um, they were able to determine that and yeah, I'm not sure what they were able to ter- determine. Right, but it, in terms of the wounds to her pelvic region, we don't know if she was alive or dead. Well, when I that think happened. at that moment she would be dying. I can't I, imagine. You would, you would, my guess is that she was probably deceased by then, but I, I don't know. Like, I mean, these are some of the more harrowing and frightful moments in this story. Like these types of 
pieces of evidence really raise a lot of questions here about how malicious these people were and how to what extent they were willing to go that went well above and beyond whatever this fantasy world that they cr were creating required. Do right, you think, I, Chad, I've wondered about Chad. Well, Trish, I'll be honest, Trisha, I brought this up with Trisha on what says it. Could Chad be a bit of a voyeur too? Someone that wanted to watch Alex do something, but not do it himself. Uh, maybe I not enough evidence. It's okay. And if you can't I go think, there, it's okay. I think I'd be more inclined to say that Chad would be a participant, but I mean, we, I didn't think that Chad would be capable of harming necessarily capable of harming JJ. And now we know the story with the, the scuffle and the marks on Chad's neck. And like, right. Clearly this is someone, this is someone who could have uh, seemingly, I mean, we don't know exactly what happened in that room. But this is someone who could assault a child, a seven-year-old right. child. So I I don't know. And you just like the first thing you've ever said about Chad, I want to say this. Before our, we ever started a podcast, before we ever sat down and started recording our conversations, the children were missing. And um, True Crime Underground, Lori Daybell, Colt Mom, that Facebook group, asked for John's opinion on something. And you had read Chad's autobiography. The first thing you ever said about Chad is pretty much that he doesn't like women. Like you read a story, he never mentions his mother. He doesn't like women. He has two sentences in his autobiography about his mother. The the whole autobiography is so clearly masculine based. Yeah, he does. You know, he he treats he married. He basically says in the autobiography that he married Tamley because she was available and she wouldn't reject him. He never married Tamley because he loved her or they had some whirlwind romance or they fell in love. He married her basically because he felt like she wouldn't say no. Yeah. And you see that, you see that fear of rejection with Lori as well in, in the text love letters that we've talked about a lot. And those are really critical to this case, by the way, for understanding Chad. Yes. He says multiple times. I, I read those on one of our lives a couple of weeks ago. He says multiple times, I'm afraid she might reject me or what if she doesn't like me, right? The, it, it's, it's the similar, that dynamic was going on with Tammy. He was very concerned that Tammy might not reciprocate. So, but he felt like she would and she obviously did marry him. So she did reciprocate, but he was concerned about it. He didn't want to be rejected. So you have this real fear of there's clearly there's some self-esteem issues there. He's not, confident in his ability to, to develop relationships with women. And yeah, he's not, he's, he's not, he's not particularly sensitive to women's feelings. That's for sure. He's very self-absorbed and, and, and immersed in this notion that he should be in control. Yes. Yes, he is very much that person. And he was very controlling. The more we look into Chad, the more controlling he was. He controlled Garth, you know, the day Tammy died, you know, took the phone from Garth. Yeah. He, we learned from Heather Daybell and Heather Daybell's interview that he was moving to Rexburg and told the whole family they were moving. They didn't really have a choice. And then Garth wasn't going to move. He was an adult. And she said he manipulated Garth into moving to Rexburg. Um, yeah, he was very controlling. He told Garth that there were evil spirits around him and that he needed to move. Right. Okay. It was it was patriarchal in the sense that the male, he's the male, he's in charge, and he's going to dictate the terms of um, – the, he's going to make decisions for the family and dictate the terms under which the family will live and reside and the rules of the house. And so, yeah, he's very much in control of everything. You've also stated when, it, you know, we've, we followed the Brian Koberger case extensively. Uh, John and I were on uh, the Dateline episode uh, featuring the um, tragedy in Moscow, Idaho. And uh, John shared a lot of thoughts about the profile of who Brian Koberger might be before we knew of him and his arrest. And you did imply back then that there could be a sexual component to 
those murders in the house. Um, that's what I wondered too with Kylie too in, in the in the brutalizing of her body, of her pelvis. Do you think that do you think that's the same type of thing? And if so, maybe you could explain that a little bit, like why someone would do that or. Yeah, there could be, you know, the, the, the fact that Chad was assaulting some other women would seem to indicate that he's making some association between violence and sex. And that that's the critical issue. The issue isn't necessarily that a crime is sexual it's or something is sexual. It's the associations with violence that that can create some type of arousal or, or make it erotic. And so I think that's that's the question is whether whether Chad makes that association. You know, it seems to me like Koberger may have made that association for sure. But but with Chad, it's not entirely clear. I think there could be that association. It seems like there probably is with Alex, but certainly possible that the violence could be somewhat arousing for Chad. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, again, I don't know enough about Chad. I don't know his history, but if it's true that he's a sexual, sexually assaulting several victims or becoming aggressive with certain victims, then, then the, it's likely or possible that there could be some connection between aggression and violence and sex. Ozzy Tad writes that Chad was probably angry from um, depressed sexual urges too. I, you know, um, again, I was on Mormon Stories earlier today. You can head to their YouTube channel to see that. And at one point, John DeLynn did state, um, anger is healthy, you know, to be angry. I can't remember what we were talking about for him to go on this bit of a tangent, bit of a rant. But I was like, thank you, John. Thank you, John DeLynn. And the one thing I thought during that discussion was that everyone talks about Chad being this humble, soft-spoken guy. Like, you never see him angry. I'm sure he was very angry, though. And what I'm concerned yeah. is that he never showed that anger. Right. And in, in that sense, Tad has a really good point that if, if we repress anger long enough, it's going to come out in various ways. And certainly he could have been repressing anger for a long time and unleashed a good portion of it on some of the victims here. So yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with that too. And, and there is a story of a neighbor. This is a conversation I had. There's a story of a neighbor. And I, I hope that maybe next week we might hear from some neighbors of Chad's, but there's a story of a neighbor uh, when Lori was behind bars and Chad was still out. There's a story of Chad going to a neighbor's home. Um, asking them to hopefully mortgage their house so that he could get money to bail his new wife, Lori, out of jail. That This is a real story. And um, allegedly during this conversation, um, the couple who, who was close to Chad, they were sitting there contemplating it. And, and finally, the woman said, Chad, where are the children? Where is the girl? And um, Chad looked up and gave a look that this person describes as so almost evil and so angry. And at that point, this person knew there was a lot more to Chad. And I, I like that metaphor, that analogy of what that means. Cause I, I agree. Right. It is as Nick points out here, there's been plenty of Sir Jeffrey Dahmer would be a good example of someone that people perceive to be as, you know, meek and humble and quiet and reticent, all the things that people have used to describe Chad. But yeah, lurking, lurking beneath that facade was something a lot more menacing. Yes. Yes. What else would you like to talk about? But before I ask you that, um, we have we have a lot of people on on chat tonight and online. I want to thank all of you for being here. One thing um, that would really help John, I mean, we're so grateful for the support and you guys are so generous. And I know not everyone can give their support through um, super chats or um, memberships to our channel. But one thing that would mean a lot to us that everyone could do 
John and I truly hope to grow our channel and to grow subscribers. If you have not yet subscribed to our channel, please consider subscribing. And if you already have, please consider telling some friends or family about us. The subscriptions help us so much and help us to grow. So that's just one thing I would love from all of you um, this week. It would mean a lot. Thank you. Now, John, um, what else would you like to talk about when it comes to, I, I fill John in, he knows everything, but I let him kind of take the lead here. What else do you feel is important to talk about when it comes to the trial last week? Do you want to talk about the 911 call from Chad? Yes. Why don't I play that really quickly? So, okay. yeah. So to set the stage to for everyone to be caught up, this week in trial, uh, Friday in particular was a day um, for Tammy Daybell to talk about Tammy Daybell and her sister Samantha testified. Tammy's only sister. It was heartbreaking. It was another heartbreaking testimony to hear from Tammy's family. And um, we then heard the 911 call when it came to the paintball gun incident where it wasn't a paintball gun. We know now it was a rifle with a silencer, most likely and right. being carried by Alex Cox. But they played that. That was on October 9th, 2019. And then on October 19th, 2019, we hear from Chad and Garth. Garth calls 911 because his mother was found deceased um and then chad takes the phone from garth and we hear this 911 call so why don't i play that right now again i believe i am using the video from east idaho news one second And I do not have it up. So one second, I'm going to, why don't you keep talking, John? And I'll, I'm going to have to Google this to bring it up. Sorry, everyone. One sec. You've listened to this, right, John? You've listened to this. Yeah, I've, li I've listened to it multiple times. I'm, I'm trying to, it's a, it's a pretty short call. So I, I was trying to decipher some elements from the call that, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to really dig deep into this call because it's so short. I think the more interesting components of the call occurred when the coroner showed up at the home and the police, were the police there? Well, you can talk about that after the call. Okay. I have pulled it up, so let me now share my screen. Okay. 
You need un there we go. I just unmuted you, babe. So you're good. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, it it's not very lengthy, but right. you know the the int I think you have to understand the context of this call, which is that Tammy's dead body has been laying there for hours, and Chad knows she's dead. He knows that she was murdered, presumably murdered. I guess. The jury hasn't convicted him yet, so let's say allegedly murdered. But while well, the cause of death was <laughs> was clearly not natural, and that was his argument. So the body's there. Then this call comes in. It's interesting that Garth is the one who makes the call. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's interesting, too. The call is made from Garth, right. who doesn't say much before the call. The phone's taken away from him. Right. And so that's interesting. So in that sense, it seems a little staged that Chad doesn't want to be the first one to make the call. I think he's trying to be emotional, but to me, it's, it's kind of a feeble attempt at emotions. I, you know, I don't, the fact that he knows she's been dead for hours and then he's responding in this manner, it clearly shows it's, it's definitely a little bit staged. I know you and I might have different opinions on that, but when he, when we just listened to the patriarchal blessing from Chad to Alex a few weeks ago in our one of our lives, and he was way more emotional about that than he was here. Interesting. So, okay, that's good. Yeah, I try to I try to put myself in the coroner's shoes, guys. And I even said this on uh, I was on with Chris Cuomo, and I said, you know, I, I'm trying to decide if he could pull the wool over my eyes. And, and that's a hard place to be. I have to all of a sudden forget everything I know about Chad Daybell to decide if I could think his tears were real. And my conclusion was, yeah, like, I guess so. But you're saying, no, it was, uh, and a lot of people disagree with me, but it sounds like even my better half is disagreeing with me that, that maybe it was, sounded very contrived and, and staged and fake. If you, if you compare this to the to his emotion during the blessing for Alex, but the blessing is way more emotional. So, yeah, you know, that's true. think about that. Think about the contrast between some guy that is presumably helped murder a bunch of people and how emotional he gets over that versus the fact that this is his wife of what, 30 plus years with five children. And he's, he's struggling to muster any emotion. So, I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of emotion, you know, and, I, and I'm willing to say that there's some interesting research showing, uh, I'll mention a guy named Jeff Larson, or Larson is L-A-R-S-E-N. Uh, he wrote an article called The Case for Mixed Emotions. Larson's research is interesting that in the sense that it shows that we can often experience multiple emotions at the same time. So emotions are typically thought of as occurring that that different emotions like happiness and sadness are, are often thought of occurring on different ends of the spectrum. So they the the term is in psychology we say opposite valences that they're they're completely different. And so the the historical you know the belief has usually been that you can't experience sadness and happiness together. But Larson's research and he's done some studies that are empirically based has shown that that's not quite true, that we can actually, it's called emotional coactivation. We can actually experience very opposite emotions like sadness and happiness together at the same time. And so, and so I think that, you know, it, that doesn't surprise me, by the way. I think that throws in a little bit of a wrinkle here in the sense that could there be some grief over the fact that this is his wife of 30 plus years and how he's recognizing that she's deceased yeah, there could be a little bit. So, but I mean, I think for the most part, he's, so there might be a little bit of sadness, let's say 10% sadness, 90% relief or elation or whatever. It, I, I, I hesitate to use the term elation because that would imply that he's happy she's dead. I don't know if that's quite true. I think he's happy that he's free to go to Lori and those are very <laughs> different interpretations. Yeah. But, right? That that's really what he wants. So the elation is not that Tammy's dead. The elation is that now he can move on to his new life and he can go see his goddess without being encumbered by a wife. So, 
But but it's interesting to speculate that, you know, like, and, and a good example of this would be Alec Murdoch. You know, a lot of people asked, was Alec Murdoch really experiencing true tears? And the short answer, I think, because we we seem to think that if you're crying like Alec Murdoch did on the stand or on the 911 call for Alec Murdoch, that somehow it can't be some combination of emotions. It has to be either all sadness and the tears are real or all something else, joy or whatever. So Yeah, that's true. We we go either or. It's a natural thing. Yeah. Right. And so that's that's not quite true. I think that Alec Murdoch actually did have some sadness over losing his family. I think, but the conflict was for him that that you know he knows he murdered him. So, uh, right. so I don't know how far he can go with the sadness. And I, I think you have something similar here with Chad. I think some of this is definitely staged. Some of this is he knows he needs to muster some emotions for the people that are going to visit the house. But I, I do think that there is a bit of grief in there. This is his wife of so many years. Uh, there's not a lot of grief, but there's a little. And I think with Alec Murdoch, you see something similar that I do believe that there was some sadness there. Um, so it's not this either or phenomenon. I think that he really did, you know, and, and for Alec, it could be, it could have been that he missed his family and, and he really did. And, and so, but on the other hand, with Alec Murdoch, I think there were other issues in play too. So it wasn't it, it wasn't mainly sadness, let's say that. So I think you have a similar dynamic, and I, I think it's important to recognize that all human beings have mixed emotions. We all are capable of experiencing conflicting emotions at the same time. And so sometimes on these types of calls or these types of situations, people go to, well, the, he's faking it because he couldn't possibly feel any sadness. He's such a psychopath or a manipulator and yeah all of that might be true <laughs> you know all Maybe, of that could yeah. very well be true <laughs> but that's not to say that he's not experiencing one percent sadness i don't know sure so, right yeah and not so, all and the, or nothing and the research larson's research i think in particular makes a strong case for this idea of mixed emotions and by the way when i'm talking about this that I talk about W.D. Winnicott a lot. He was a British psychoanalyst who Winnicott talked a lot about the idea of ambivalence, which is that when infants are born and and he says like from the, he says from the, from, from the go is the way he puts it. Infants, you know, they want to survive. And so they want to be fed and they expect the mother to be there all the time. And the mother isn't there all the time. And so infants cry and have frustration and that's the beginning of ambivalence in the sense that none of us get all of our needs met precisely at the moment we want them met, right? We don't. We don't get our needs met. And so when we don't, we get frustrated and we see the object, in this case, the mother with an infant, we see the object that's not needing our needs as ad- adversarial to us. And so, right, so we all have these mixed emotions, these emotions of ambivalence where, of course, we love the person who's feeding us and helping us survive and taking care of us. But on the other hand, because we're not getting all our needs met, we also have frustration and anger towards that person. And that's yeah. how ambivalence develops in human beings. It develops from our earliest days on this planet, our earliest days that we're alive, and it continues throughout life. And so I, I, I think that's an important element of all of these crimes is that, you know, we should maybe hesitate a little bit when we want to jump in and vilify people and say, Oh, he couldn't possibly be feeling this. Or, I mean, yeah, maybe he's not, but you know, maybe he is because we all have ambivalence and we all have mixed emotions. And I think your, your idea, by the way, that, that some of the tears were real. Yeah. I, you know, a little bit, I think, I think a little bit, some of the, maybe maybe a small percentage of the salt in those tears is, is real, but not a lot. This shows how manipulative he is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, here we know, here we know something happened here. We know his wife was just murdered. Yeah. Right. And And she's been murdered for hours. She's been dead on the floor for hours. And I think the most interesting point or facet of that story is, when the people show up at the home 
and how he tries to sell them on, you know, he, he, right. Maybe you could talk about this, that he tries to sell them on his narrative. Yeah. Uh, first the deputy arrives, um, then, um, meaning law enforcement. And then after law enforcement arrives, the deputy coroner arrives. And then after the deputy coroner arrives, the actual coroner, Brenda Dye arrives. And just, so you know, we're hearing these witness testimonies in order. First we yeah. hear from the deputy, then we hear from the deputy coroner, and then we hear from the coroner who, uh, they were all there. It's, it had been disputed whether or not Brenda Dye, the coroner had been there. We all know now she was there. She got there a little bit later than everyone else, but they were all there. And they all noticed strange things that were off. Um, I, I, I let the deputy law enforcement completely off the hook because it truly is not her job to make any sort of assessment as to whether or not there should be an autopsy as far as I'm concerned. But the deputy coroner and the coroner, um, another story, and they, they noticed she had been uh, dead for hours. In fact, um, they even put on her death certificate, the coroner did, Brenda died, that she had died maybe around midnight. They noticed the red foam coming out of her mouth. Um, so did we. We saw photos of the scene. We saw Tammy in her bedroom, in her pajamas, lying on her bed, her legs off of the bed, stiff. You could see it just from the photo, just how stiff she was. Um, we saw what looked like blood coming from her mouth. Uh, we'd all heard about this pink foam, but it was there was a lot, and it was real, and it was intense, and there was a towel below, by the bed that Chad had used. And, you know, it was interesting. I kept thinking, well, Chad, why would you have not wiped that off? Uh, why would you have not wiped that red foam off to make things look better? And then we learned that he had been. He, he admitted to the coroner, Brenda Dye, that uh, the towel on the floor he had been using to wipe his wife's mouth off, which that should also be a red flag than if he actually confessed. I thought, why aren't you doing that and then hiding it? But he was doing it and told him. Um, and uh, then she picked up the towel and did it as well. And the moment she wiped some of it off, more came. It just kept coming. Right, which is not consistent with natural causes. I'd also like to point out something else that people, not all people realize. And um, this is from an interview that I would, again, recommend to everyone listening to. There is another mysterious death in this case, if there couldn't be one more. Eldon Clausen is his name. Eldon Clausen died September 29th. He was a neighbor of Chad Daybell's. They were in the same ward, same congregation, went to church together, friends. And Elder Cla El Eldon Clausen died at his house at, in his 50s um, on September 29th. And there was no autopsy, but the coroner put down that it was a pulmonary embolism. And that is also what's on his obituary that you can look up. Um, so you have to also realize that Brenda dies coming on scene to Tammy's death when just two weeks earlier, she had attended another um, unattended death that was also a pulmonary embolism. I just don't get, I just don't get it. I, that wasn't discussed at the court at all. This is me discussing it, but I just don't get, that's just one other red flag, right? Like what is going on? Yeah. Anyway. What so what are they saying that the what are they saying that Chad is saying though? How is Chad describing what's going on in the room? Chad is describing that his wife fell off the bed. So this is exactly how he described it though. I mean, the details he was giving are bizarre. First off, uh Tammy's going through menopause. That's the first thing he says. Oh, menopause and my wife, and she's having hot flashes. So because of those hot flashes, Tammy sleeps with her feet outside of the blanket. Thus, in the middle of the night, it makes sense that she fell out of bed, uh, but she, her head and her torso fell out of bed, which, okay, right there doesn't make sense. If her feet were the, the, were the part of her body that was outside of the cover, you would think her feet would fall off the bed, not her head and her torso. But he claims her head and torso fell out of the bed and that Garth had to come in. He called for Garth and they put her back into the bed together. And again, we saw photos. I just want you to know um, the mattress was off the box spring a bit and Tammy's head was laying in the middle of the bed, her feet off the bottom of the bed, sticking straight out like this was, they didn't even put her in bed properly again. Um, 
as so so he, that's what he said happened um there there were questions from uh the prosecution that weren't really answered but they kept asking if anyone if Chad had ever mentioned Tammy hitting her head on the nightstand and all of the witnesses said no but we haven't it hasn't been brought up why that was asked like no one mentioned her hitting her head on a nightstand but uh the prosecution asked every witness that question so I'm we're probably going to find out about that more Monday so that's that's interesting and then each one of them talked about how his story would increase Brenda Dye explained that after she noticed the red foam and um the pooling of the blood she was she thought she should maybe ask if she had had seizures and so she said has she had seizures and then chad says oh yes yeah there you go yeah seizures and she's had some shaking episodes um chad referred to his wife as very un, uh, weak and unhealthy hasn't been able to do much um her blood pressure has been high all these things. And then we learned that, no, she's taking high fitness classes and doing burpees and planks <laughs> with yeah. Emma T. Bell. I can't even do that. Okay. So, so here's Tammy and, and she looks fit. She is fit. She's also taking clogging lessons. Think of river dance. That's pretty much it's high aerobic dancing. And she's doing these twice a week and she's preparing for a 5k race. And then her, um, Sister Samantha shares that Tammy had visited her two weeks prior because Chad told her to visit her. I actually think this is the moment Chad was hoping that she got in a car accident. She had told Lori she's going to get in a car accident and then said to Tammy, go visit your family in Utah. So she goes, doesn't get in a car crash and lets um, her sister Samantha know just how healthy she is and then comes home. So um, these are all the things we're hearing and seeing. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. So uh, I'll make another comparison with the Alec Murdoch situation that when, when Alec Murdoch made his 911 call, one of the first things he said is my son, Paul has received a lot of threats. My son, Paul is under fire on social media, right? He's, he's trying to frame the narrative. And that's exactly what Chad is trying to do when all of these people enter the home and, and they're starting to write, they're starting to try to develop some hypotheses about what's going on. And Chad's trying to set the frame. He's trying to set the narrative, but it's, it's, it's really, it's really peculiar though. Right. Because he keeps changing his story and amending his story and adding to the story. And like all of that to me would be indicative of a guilty conscience. Okay. Yeah. When you, because he doesn't have to say anything. If this was a, a death from natural causes, he'd just say, help her. I don't know what happened, but he's got a theory. He's, he's over explaining the situation. And just like Alec Murdoch doesn't need to say all these crazed people on the internet want to kill my son. He doesn't, he's telling you, he's trying to set the narrative here and, and have, law enforcement accept that. And I think that's exactly what Chad does, but actually with Chad, it works because there is no autopsy and they don't consider this to be a peculiar death, right? This, so in, in some ways what Chad does, it works perfectly well. And I guess it worked for Alec Murdoch for a while until, until law enforcement was really forced to investigate. So, I mean, it took him a while to get there, but it, it's interesting that, that in both cases, I think when you have someone in a 911 call or at the, at the murder scene or the scene of a death and they're over explaining and trying to tell you why something happened and how it happened and, and it doesn't make sense and it's contradictory, that's a red flag. And I'm surprised that somebody there didn't say, wait a minute, this, this doesn't add up at all. The bleeding right. from the mouth, all of it, right? The bleeding from the mouth. He couldn't explain that. He couldn't explain any of it, really. Right. Um, you're right. It does remind me of Alec Murdoch. You're really right there. I didn't do that comparison, but it's that's spot on. It was very much like that night with um, Alec Murdoch calling and trying to set this narrative and set this stage. You know, the, the coroner um, asked... Let, let Chad know that ultimately she gets to decide if, if there was an autopsy. Chad said they'd prefer not. She said it was actually Emma Daybell. He was really adamant about not having their mother get an autopsy 
the coroner, Brenda Dye, explained Emma's um, desire to not have Tammy be autopsied as she didn't want those type of things done to her mother's body. And I couldn't ha then help but think of Tylee out in Chad's yard, you know, and the difference there. Um, right. And it's, it's, yeah, it, what a contrast, but it's also up to law enforcement to determine whether it's a possible crime scene. And that's what she said in the end too. She said in the end, it's our choice. Yeah. Possible crime scene and an autopsy. They didn't either. They didn't even do it. Right. Autopsy. The, the blood coming from the mouth, the inconsistencies in Chad's stories. These were all red flags. I think at some point, law, somebody from law enforcement, it should have said, this doesn't make sense. I don't know for sure, but we need to investigate this further. Chad Daybell, will you please come in for an interview? We need to talk to you, right? Like, I mean, and we know the numbers are astronomical in terms of when a spouse is is in he is healthy and they're young, like Tammy, and they're found dead. You know, this I don't know that over ninety percent of those cases in, have some involvement of the spouse. So. To not somehow declare that circumstance to be suspicious and to maybe designate it as a crime scene seems unusual. I mean, I know hindsight is, it's a lot easier in hindsight to make that determination now, but but this is what these people do. That This is their job is to assess these discrepancies and to make sense of it, right? And I guess it's true there's probably not a lot of murders in Rexburg, so maybe maybe they're not accustomed to to dealing with crime scenes and making sense of crime scenes. So I'm, I'll give them the benefit there, but still the it's, it's a peculiar situation. Well, I've heard that things have changed was we were going back into the courtroom after a little break, the woman in front of me heard me talking with the woman next to me as we were kind of being shuffled back into the courtroom. And I, and I, uh, we were talking about the coroner not doing that autopsy and why in the world would she have not done that? And she turned to us and said, well, just so you know, things have changed. There was a recent death in Island Park, Idaho, and the person didn't want an autopsy. And they said, no, we're doing it. So it sounds like at least some lessons were learned, hopefully. Right. If there's any question marks, it seems like an autopsy would, might be warranted there's even the least bit of suspicion, then perhaps they should have moved in that direction. Yeah. I shared the link to our neighbor interview. I'd really recommend it. Um, I'll try to share it one more time. Thanks everyone for sharing where you're from. It sounds like maybe the chat's a little too slow for that. I'll try to speed it up a bit. Uh, I, I love to hear where everyone's listening from. It's amazing. It's, we have uh, Japan and South Africa and, uh, every state. Um, it's incredible. Um, one other thing I want to bring up, John, and I know we need a head. It's, um, 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 but we learned this week as well, something that you had stated years ago. Um, you'd stated in June of 2020 when people asked why in the world did Chad Daybell bury the children in his yard? So it was right after the children's remains were found buried in Chad Daybell's yard. And everyone was aghast because we thought they might never find the kids because their bodies, uh, you know, the Idaho, Idaho's wilderness is vast. Yellowstone is vast. Uh, we didn't think that we'd ever find these children's bodies. And we learned that they were buried in Chad Daybell's yard and everyone was shocked at not just how horrendous it was, but why would he do that? And back then you had said, you, you shared power and you shared I'm sure he could see the children's graves from his kitchen window. He wants to look out and see those graves from his kitchen window. They took us into Chad Daybell's house during trial this week to show that, um, to so show that search that day, to show the different uh, perspectives. And they took a picture from Chad's room, Chad's bedroom. It was labeled, and here we are, Chad's day, Chad Daybell's bedroom looking straight out onto Tylee's grave. And then down in the kitchen, here's the view from the kitchen. Now we're looking out straight out at JJ's grave. I might've gotten those two mixed up. I don't know which one was which. I don't know which child's grave one could see from the kitchen or the bedroom, but it was one and then the other. 
And um, it's hard. it was devastating, but I, I couldn't help but think that's exactly what you said. And since that time, a lot of people have been asking the question again, why did Chad bury these children in his yard? And I was wondering if you wanted to say anything to that. It's a reminder of his power. It's a reminder of his perception of himself as a deity, as larger than life and what he's capable of. He has the power of life over death. And that's what I said then, that I think it's similar to a serial killer keeping mementos or trophies or objects. They're almost... There's almost like a shaman type quality, right? That that if somehow you have these items that are related to the murders, then it gives you this power. It makes you special. And I think for Chad, it's a reminder that he is the architect of this vision. He's the person, the deity potentially that's going to run the New Jerusalem and so it's a reminder of his power and that he has the ability to influence life and death. And that's what he wants more than anything. Thank you. This week, I also posted a tribute to Tammy. We often focus on these innocent children whose lives were lost, rightfully so. They were absolutely innocent and should have been protected by these people. On Friday, we were able to hear from, again, Tammy's sister and hear about Tammy. And I shared a tribute to her that I hope um, many will listen to because I I do want Tammy to, um, I hope that Tammy's remembered also as a victim of domestic violence, as someone who was manipulated and controlled and um, so I want to I want to share that too today. Tammy didn't deserve this, and yeah, right. And, and before you do, I just want to make the comment that you know that with Chad in particular, and we know his trial. I don't. Do, is there any speculation about when Chad's trial will be held? No. I mean, there's speculation. Is there any accuracy to that speculation? I don't know. I don't know of anything. I, I think that for Chad, at least, that he might have, I don't, I don't think this would, be, I don't think he has a persuasive case for any involvement or no involvement with the murders of the children, but he's going to have a really difficult time arguing that he had nothing to do with Tammy's death. So ironically, I think he has a real uphill battle with, with Tammy and she's such an innocent victim. They're all innocent victims, of course, but I think Tammy is going to be a really difficult problem for Chad's defense. And so, yeah, I, um, and clearly they're 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 tying in Lori as a co-conspirator. And so so I think that that it's interesting that like with Alec Murdoch, that Paul in many ways was the demise of Alec. And I think Tammy for Chad is probably gonna be the biggest obstacle. For Lori, I think it's the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Many people are asking questions that uh, John and I have actually um, discussed in detail in our podcast. I'm trying to share the link right now. I'm not doing too good of a job. I'm trying to pull it up. But um, I'd like to share that. Hold on. Sorry. John, is there anything you'd like to conclude with? I, I have. I am. I'm good. I feel good about where I am with questions. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No, I think, I think we've covered everything from this week. Um, I just shared our podcast playlist. I'd recommend everyone um, 
to that. Um, yeah, recommend everyone listen to that and or re-listen. And um, thank you everyone for your patience when it comes to our podcast. I I am in charge of editing and producing our podcast episodes, and I've already spent several. Uh, John knows I've spent already. Uh, there's been many all nighters for me already, and I'm I am working on that, and I'll I'll be posting um, one tonight, but. Thank you for those that join here and, and understand that um, YouTube is a good place right now during the trial as we try to catch up on both platforms. I guess that's to say we, we have YouTube caught up, but we're struggling with our, our podcast platform. So if you know of anyone that listens only to our podcast, maybe encourage them at this time to jump on YouTube um, and just have some understanding because there's only so much two people can do, but we're trying. Yeah, don't don't give up on us. If you're listening to our podcast, we'll we'll get them posted. I know. I mean, it's like it's so important during this trial. This trial's everything, and yet, um, unfortunately, we can't clone ourselves. So <laughs> we're doing our best. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining with us tonight. Thank you for your support. Again, please remember to subscribe. We are so grateful for our new subscribers. We're so grateful for the likes we receive. Um, we want to grow this community. It's incredible. We want to, um, maybe it's bold to say reinvent the true crime genre and, uh, your support, um, means everything through subscriptions, through likes, through telling your friends. So thank you for all you do. Well, just the conversations we have with our community, they're amazing. And our community is so smart and intelligent and insightful and compassionate. And that's, we love that. That's what we want from, that was our, our dream in starting a true crime channel was to bring in a community that was, was really smart and considerate and kind and insightful. And, and we've done that. And we're very grateful. We're very blessed to have found our people through this medium. Yes. Yes, it is. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for all you do. So tomorrow I'll be live tweeting in the courtroom. I again did not get into court. And again, a hidden gem wrote and said, hey, I have a ticket. Would you like it? I'm not able to go. And so I'll be in the courtroom once again. Um, it is not easy to get in the courtroom. It's usually gone uh, in 30 seconds. And sometimes okay. it's luck. So okay. to those who have allowed me to be in the courtroom every day, we say thank you as well. So, so is it still a lottery? It's still a, a lottery system, right? It is a lottery every day. And again, a lot of it is luck because it's, um, uh, it was eight o'clock still. So the lottery starts at eight and it was at 8 AM on Friday. Um, when it told me, sorry, uh, you didn't get put into the lottery. You're too late. And it was like eight, it was eight o'clock in like 36 seconds. So that's yeah. how fast they yeah. all went. Okay. And so I have been in the courtroom every day, I think, except for one. And so it's not just because of me. It's because of a lot of effort. And I just want to thank everyone. So I have my alarm set every morning, but it doesn't always happen. So thank you, everyone. I'll be live tweeting tomorrow. I think Brian Enton is also in town. I don't know if he's in town now or if he's in town tomorrow, but um, News Nation, let me know he's coming back. And uh, uh, we'll be there too. And so thanks for following along. I'll be doing lunch lives and then um, trying to give reports in the evening as well. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank you, guys. Thanks. We'll see you. Good night. All right. Good night.